Hey there. So let's get started here. So we, we be talking about uh, liquid immersion cooling helps data center sustainability. And uh, this presentation was put together by Nishi Ahuja, Sandeep Ahuja, and uh, Sundaram uh, Chintamani. Unfortunately, Nishi and Sandeep had a family emergency and they can't be here, so that's why I'm here. And so I will cover their, their part of the presentation here. My name is Jessica Goldbrand, and we got Sundaram here uh, as well. So the outline of this presentation is uh, to talk about Intel's cooling strategy and what the drivers, the key drivers are for liquid cooling. Uh, what are the liquid cooling technologies, uh, as well as uh, the immersion fluid specification that we are working on to contribute to OCP currently. And then talk about the case study comparing air and immersion cooling to look at the power savings that we get if moving from air to, to immersion. And then end the presentation with call to action. So Intel's cooling strategy is really uh, showing the leadership by driving development and enablement of cooling technologies, and that goes for both air and liquid, right? So whatever the customers are using, we're supporting them to use those technologies. We also have uh, sustainability goals, right, by reducing operational carbon footprint, and that's uh, what Sundram is gonna talk about in the later part of the presentation. We also had setting up partnerships and collaborations uh, with the ecosystem on standards and enablements, and we we'll talk a little bit about that regarding the fluid specification. So Intel really continues to be uh, flexible in order to, for cooling technologies to meet the customer demands. So cooling technologies and energy efficiency, as we already talked about a little bit here, right? If we're looking at the green bar at the bottom, we have the PUE or the power usage effectiveness. If you're looking at air cooling, of course, the values here will differ depending upon uh, where you are in which climate that you're operating. If you're operating in a hot and humid climate, these numbers will be different. But if we're saying from the left-hand side, we have traditional air cooling, and you can get down to about a 1.3, 1.2. Depending upon where you are in the Pacific Northwest, you might be able to get down to a 1.1 as well, right? Um, but again, that depends upon if you have the luxury of putting the data center in the, in the climate that is cooler. Uh, for liquid, right, the cooling technique and that's what we're gonna focus on uh, today. Really, the liquid cooling that we have is immersion or cold plate. So immersion, that's when you're taking your IT equipment and it's fully uh, immersed or in direct contact with the dielectric liquid. Uh, this can then offer about, of course there'll be some losses, but about 100% of heat capture, uh, just because all the components are in the liquids. For cold plate, technology, so this is where you basically have um, a heat exchanger on top of the high power or power density components, and you're piping liquid in in order to cool those components. If you're putting uh, cold plates on the CPUs of the server, you will about capture about 60% of the heat or so, and generally the rest is, uh, is then uh, air-cooled. So, these are the different than liquid cooling uh, technologies here. And as I said, you can get down to lower PUE. Liquid is more efficient, transferring heat away from the hot components than what air is. So the key drivers that we're seeing for liquid cooling, one is the increasing TDPs, or increasing power and power density, as I was talking about. And we're seeing that also for, of course, for the CPU. This is. I mean, a trend that we've been seeing for a while, uh, power continues to go up. Uh, and at one point, it will not be cost effective to continue to do air cooling, or at some point you will also reach a limit where you can't really uh, cool the components anymore. So that's one of the drivers. Not only, and I should say, it's not only the CPU that is increasing in power, but if you're looking at the power of the server and power density of those, they continue to go up uh, other components are also increasing in power. 
To the second one, the second key driver that we see is uh, sustainability uh, goals and regulations. So sustain sustainability goals, as you uh, probably seen in the news, have uh, been communicated a lot of both large and small installation and companies are having a very uh, strong and aggressive uh, uh, sustainability goals of reducing carbon footprint, of becoming carbon negative, and so on. And for example, just to mention an example here, in Shanghai, you're not allowed to uh, put a data center in place if you can't achieve a PUE that is less than 1.3, right? So again, hot and humid climate, so that's where it comes in uh, to, to uh, another driver for, for liquid cooling. The third one that we see is really the growth of edge deployments. So edge deployments where you have uh, compute, you go away from the data center a um, very controlled environment that you have to smaller scale installations that are spread out uh, throughout the country. And uh, the, one of the challenges there is to create an environment for the IT equipment that is uh, basically, uh, uh, basically the same no, no matter where you are in the country, right? And that's where immersion can provide an advantage because you can create that kind of unified environment for the IT equipment because it's all in the liquid. So those are the three uh, drivers that we see for liquid cooling. And liquid cooling, I already mentioned a little bit about, okay, what are the technologies of liquid cooling, right? We have cold plate technology and we got immersion as well. So cold plate, again, it's, uh, you have a heat, basically a heat exchanger you're putting onto the high power components, the components with the most stringent thermal requirements, uh, and then you're piping a liquid in, in order to cool it. And, but you can do that both in single phase as well as in two phase, right? So in two phase, uh, you have a liquid that has a lower boiling temperature and it's really the phase change between liquid and gas where you have very efficient heat transfer. And that goes also for immersion. So immersion, the IT equipment is in direct contact with the dielectric liquid. And again, you can use single phase or you can use two phase immersion there uh, as well, right? Single phase, you can think about you're basically replacing air with the liquid. Liquid is more efficient transporting the heat away, right? And in two phase, you also have the added uh, kind of benefit of having the phase change of efficient heat transfer from the, from the hot components. So both single phase, two phase, both for cold plate as well as, as immersion. So um, what we're also uh, seeing here, I mentioned it in the initially in the agenda, uh, we're also driving immersion fluid specification. And what we're aiming at here, and we're doing this through OCP, um, and uh, what we're aiming at here is really generating a specification that can meet the cooling requirements that are currently there, as well as future cooling requirements, uh, as well as meeting the signal integrity uh, requirements that we have. So we're currently going through uh, and getting this um, uh, specification reviewed in the immersion work stream. And a shout out to the, the immersion project team for providing the opportunity and the detailed feedback and specifically Puneeth who's leading material compatibility group as well as uh, John and Rolf that are leading the immersion uh, work group. So we're getting a, a lot of uh, good community feedback uh, in, in those sessions. And what we've done for the immersion fluid specification is basically instead of specifying each parameter, fluid parameter by itself, is really of saying this is the capability that we want the fluid to have. And we then define that in terms of figure of merits. So we are saying we have four different figure of merits uh, and it's based upon, we can have a figure of merit one here, for example, is based upon natural convection. How can I enhance the natural convection 
of the components in, in the immersion fluid. So talking about, um, so these are then fluid parameters like um, um, heat transfer coefficient, thermal expansion, specific heat density, dynamic viscosity of the fluid. So basically what we've done is taking the nusselt number, looking at natural convection, and taking away all the dimensional parameters there. We are only interested in looking at really the fluid properties. So that's for natural convection, but not, you don't only uh, at times have only natural convection for cooling the, the components. You also can have forced convection. There could be pumps in the tanks, right? And, uh, it provided force convection as well. So looking at a developing flow in the, in the heat sink, if you look at the, the expression for that, and then again, take away the dimensional parameters, uh, you, you end up with this figure of merit two. For the figure of merit three, it's really about reducing the pressure drop of forcing a fluid through a, through a heat sink, uh, which ends up uh, actually just being the the dynamic viscosity. And for two-phase uh, application, it's really uh, looking at the critical heat flux uh, for nucleation boiling. Uh, and this is then the figure of merit four that we have. So those are, we generated figure of merits, right, in order to say these are the properties that we want or the capabilities out of the fluids uh, that we're after. And, uh, Again, it's written to capture then IT equipment cooling requirements that we have as well as uh, signal integrity requirements. And that's what I have for the first section here. And then I'm handing over to Sundram to go through uh, the next section of looking at power savings that we can get using immersion versus air. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. So, as Jessica explained, immersion cooling can save a lot of power. In this particular section, we want to show a case study comparing air cooling and immersion cooling. Uh, so we want to compare, I don't know, ISO or equal data center performance levels at two different geos. One is in a typical US geo, uh, we pick two US Oregon location, and then another geo like PRC. So what we did here, we have uh, considering a case of SESP building uh, 10,000 server uh, data center. Uh, that the, we are picking ISO server configurations. We are looking at uh, two socket Xeon uh, with uh, ISO core count, ISO memory channel speed. So basically ISO server config with the ISO performance as well, so which means they operate at ISO power. So it's essentially, we have 10,000 servers with similar core count and similar power and similar capacity, everything. So your platform, uh, so now what we want is we want to build these 10,000 servers, one using air cooling solutions, other one using immersion cooling. The left side of the bar is the air cooling where because of this, uh, the two socket servers, we have to build a two U and two socket spread core. And we also need to use um, enhanced to volume air cooling heat sink because to cool the server uh, using, the, using the fans. The right side, the, all the heat is captured uh, using the liquid, no fans are required. So we can do a one U, two socket spread, uh, spread core servers. And uh, the other difference is the PUE. PUE is the, uh, as Jessica was mentioning, uh, is the power um, of the data center over the IT equipment power. And uh, typically in US hyperscalers, they are really extremely good and uh, they are super optimized. They can get down to 1.1, whereas in the hot and humid climates, uh, like PRC, it gets to as high as 1.5, and this more representing even the edge uh, data center location where uh, it's uh, 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 operating in different uh, environments. Whereas with the immersion cooling, you can get the PU down as low as 1.07. And uh, so given these two, you are, we are uh, comparing um, uh, the, the, the Two solutions, one is air cooling, immersion cooling, how much is the power is saved, right? 
The next file basically shows how much the power is saved. Uh, so basically, the left set of bars is for the uh, US Oregon Geo. The right set of bars is for the PRC Geo. They are stacked up bars, right? The, the, the bottommost bar is the CPU and memory power. As we said, we assume ISO server configurations. The power, power should be equal. The only difference is basically with the immersion cooling, your CPU TJ reduces. 15C. That, so essentially, to get the same perf uh, uh, per socket or perf per core as in air cooling, you re, you get need to consumes a little bit less power, like a 40 watt per server. So that reduces the CPU and memory power. Otherwise, they are roughly the same. The platform power, the next bar, it reduces because you get rid of the fans in the in the immersion cooling. Your air cooling requires so much the fan power. The fan power is gone, so that reduces the, the platform power. The top set of bar is where all your infrastructure facility power, right? So that actually is also combined with your, all the power in your uh, in the platform, the power losses, your AC to DC conversion, DC to DC, all the VR losses in the platform. They all scale down uh, proportionately with the server power. As your server power reduces because you get rid of the fan, your server power reduces, those losses also reduces. Combined with a lower PUE, that reduces the top more post bar. The net, you save about 3 megawatt, about 15% in the US Oregon. And if going to the uh, PRC side in the right side of the bar, again, it's a similar, except that your uh, PUE is much higher in the PRC, so you, uh, you are able to reduce a lot higher power in the, the topmost bar. The net, you save about 11 megawatt or 38%. So the net, you have 15 to 38% reduction in the overall data center operating power produced by the, the immersion cooling, which is, which is, which is uh, the power is one of the, it reduces the overall OPEX for the, for the data center. And if they not use renewable energy, it reduces significantly operating carbon footprint as well. So we, so we are, um, as Jessica explained, uh, Intel is driving uh, leadership, and we are uh, looking, collaborating with many partners, including liquid cooling vendors, many liquid cooling vendors, um, on the broad, to enable and deploy the broad cooling technologies. And Intel is a partner for the cooling requirements, and uh, we all request the audience, basically interested folks, to come and join the OCP project on the cooling environment. Thank you.